We have quite a treat today because we're bringing on our good friend, Marcia Montenegro, who you know and love from Christian Answers for the New Age and her amazing book that she co-wrote with Don Vino called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret. If you haven't read this book yet, please get it. The link is below. And Marcia and I are going to be talking to a new friend of ours today, a sister in Christ, beautiful lady named Jillian Lencor, who has the story of why she quit using Enneagram how Jesus woke her up, opened her eyes, and she's going to tell the truth about Enneagram. If you're using Enneagram right now, I'm going to pray that you just watch this video and learn and grow as we're all doing in Christ. So thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. So Jillian, how long ago did you um, use the Enneagram and how, how much were you into it? I was... It was my life. And that is shameful to say because I'm a practicing Christian, but I will tell you that I talked more about the Enneagram than I ever did about the gospel. Everyone I ran into, I would say, have you heard of the Enneagram? What's your type? Oh, I bet I could tell you what your type is. Tell me about yourself. Um, I, it, it consumed me. It consumed my marriage. We used it to um, be a tool to help you know, us heal or have a language to help us communicate better. Um, even with my children, there's an Enneagram test for children. And I was taking the test on my children's behalf and wanting to know what their type was so that I would mother them the correct way and be sensitive to their type. Um, I was a minister's wife just two months ago. We ended up leaving that church, but I did an entire women's ministry uh, night on it. We had more women show up for that than anything else. Um, I would say that I was heavily into it as a, in the Christian Enneagram. (laughs) Um, And it started off by getting the book, Sacred Enneagram. That's how I got it. I got it for Christmas. I had never heard of it. And I had known about like Myers-Briggs and and I liked personality tests. And that's what it was kind of introduced to me as, as a personality thing. So me, my husband and our best friend sat down, we took the test and it was so eerily accurate that we just became consumed with learning more and on Instagram especially there are so many pages dedicated to each type and I felt so completely understood I felt like I finally understood my husband (laughs) um and yeah we we were just so into it um fast forward a little bit to Um, God just taking a hold of me and wrecking my faith. I had such bad theology and I didn't even know it. Um, I grew up in the church. I went to Bible college. I married a minister, um, but I did not know the true gospel. And um, I was actually learning about Elizabeth Elliot and her life was so selfless. And I was so into like, I was a body positive influencer. So self was so a part of my quote unquote gospel. Like I was the treasure of of God. He died for me because I'm so wonderful. And I was like, this is like a different holiness than I even am learning about or teaching about. What is this? And then I watched American gospel and through that over the last year, my theology, the, what I know about the word of God, just my eyes were opened, which then led me into wondering what am I believing and what am I letting into my home? Which ends up going to the Enneagram and uh, yeah, hearing about um, Claudio, I can never say his last name. Naranjo. Yes. (laughs) So at uh, at the conference, I told them I had made up this tale that all this came from millennia ago and and that this information came from the Sufis. Yes. I told him that actually Oscar Richardson had not described any of the Enneotypes either. Actually in the, uh, uh, seven months we spent with him he devoted about six hours to talk about the Enneagram but he never came to describe any one of the types that was right. all that came from Enrique Chile, Enrique Chile yeah. yeah yeah so that yeah. came from my own uh, observations but mostly from automatic writing it automatic came, writing yeah it came f- to me through automatic writing what did uh, the, the specific information and it's any types ab- ab- about any types which yes. I then verified through observation right. because this, I was surrounded by people Right. I was teaching and exploring with. And I had, <coughs> I had friends in Erika who told me 
essentially the same story yeah. that John there Hale. was no mention of no others besides you yes. said there was no mention of any of the types except from you yes so that you were the origin <clears throat> of the anyotype concept. And you were the origin of the word anyotype. Yes. You suggested it and I adopted yes. that idea. Yeah. Him admitting, I mean, just admitting where it comes from, that was enough for me. I was like, no more. You know, absolutely not. And I had a deep, I mean, <laughs> I may cry even now, a deep grief and repentance that I allowed this into my home and to my children. Um, Christians don't take it seriously and it is very dangerous and very serious and it takes us completely away from God and it's such a tool for self it's so deceptive and it's insane it's so good at deceiving <laughs> you know like there are so many churches and so many Christian things that are saying like this is good this is God's tool and it's not so I watched your videos with you guys talking about it. Um, I watched uh, Claudio's entire thing where he admits that it wasn't this ancient origin thing and he got it from automatic writing, which is completely satanic. And yeah, that was it for me. And I called my husband and I said, you have to watch this. And we both repented together and we had to talk to our children and apologize. And it was, yeah, it's been a, it's been a roller coaster, but I'm so grateful uh, for women like you and for people who are talking about it because everything I knew up until that point was that it was a good thing. It was a, it was a biblical thing. It's so great to hear your testimony there, um, Julie. Thank you so much for sharing that because I've been warning about this for so many years and I really did feel for the longest time, like I really felt like the lone voice in the wilderness oh. <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, at first people didn't even know about it because I started warning about it in 2014. And most people didn't have no idea what it was, so no one really paid attention. But once it got into the church, 2016 and later with the Road Back to You and then the Sacred Enneagram, and then it began to kind of pick up steam. And so people were hearing about it here and there and hearing, of course, like you said, it was good. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then I started getting responses, but people were kind of like, not happy about what I was saying. <laughs> and I had to keep saying it and repeating myself and giving the evidence for it. So it was really a struggle there to be warning about it like that. But I, I was so concerned because I knew that this was not from God and this could only do damage. If something that is not from God and actually has a spiritual dimension to it that is not from God, which is what the Enneagram is true, the Enneagram, then it's going to do damage in the church if it's presented as a Christian tool. And it has, like you said, you know, you realize how damaging it was. The way that it was, the way that it was so biblically presented is they talk about like when you have your type, like I was a type four and that means I'm artistic and creative, which I am, you know, I am those things. Right. And they spin it to say, well, you know, you, Jill, as a type four, you're the thing that you get from God is uniqueness. So I just felt like that's, that's my thing. That's my characteristic that I, that God has given to me. Like he was pouring, you know, each little characteristic into all these different types. Um, and then they talk about your core sin. And so they give you a core sin. They give you a Bible character. So then you're relating to these people in the Bible who have their own Enneagram types wow. and um, your childhood wound. I mean, and it was so eerily accurate, but it makes sense because other than God, who has been observing us for 6,000 plus years? I mean, Satan, <laughs> of course, he's so smart and deceptive. And my husband and I, when we really started talking about this and, and repenting over it, um, we started talking about the contrast of the nine types versus the nine fruit of the spirit. No, I don't know many people who are having conferences about the fruit of the spirit, but yet that is what we're supposed to be um, living out and growing in as Christians. And my husband made such a good point. He said, isn't it interesting that the fruit of the spirit, the nine fruit of the spirit are inclusive, but the nine types are exclusive. It's like, I'm a four, you're not, you know, you're an eight, we're, we're divisive, but we're supposed to be like, have the fruit of the spirit, which is, it brings us together. It's gentleness, self-control, love, and peace. 
And I just, I hated that I was more excited to talk to people about the Enneagram than I was Jesus. And mm -hmm. that was a huge thing I had to really just like look at. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to think that that's what I spent years <laughs> doing, but I did. I understand, you know, Joanne. that's true. I'm, yeah, that the Enneagram does become, it starts to replace mm -hmm. scripture. It starts to replace the gospel. I just had a comment from a woman the other day. She said, I noticed people were talking more about the Enneagram than the gospel. And she said, so I started getting very suspicious about it because that didn't seem right. And that's, it does, it starts to replace. I mean, it's a, it's a new age tool that comes from men who did spirit contact. You know, it's not going to bring anything good. And like you said, it was divisive. So people are in these different types and they're looking at themselves or looking at other people through their filter, their type. And it's not the unity in Christ. Right. And, you know, it's not being conformed to the image of Christ. So that was what you said was so important. And it's sprinkled in. I mean, like when Jacob is my husband, we were talking about it. I was like, how many times throughout the last year or two years did we go to the Enneagram to work on our marriage as opposed to the word of God? He's like, we didn't really go to the word of God during that time really at all. You're right. Because we were going to the Enneagram, which had biblical sprinklings. But that is blasphemous. Like, no, that is not the authority of anything, especially when you know where it comes from. And where I'm having, which you two can speak to, I'm ha now women are telling me, well, they're using like the first Corinthians passage. Well, it, we can redeem it. It, it you know, just because it has its origins, we can, we can make it holy. Um, or they're saying like, um, well, basically that is what they're saying. And it's very, it's like, they're just not, taking it serious yeah you're right and that question um or that that response from people that it can be redeemed is very common probably one of the most commonly used so i actually have an article on my website can god redeem anything <laughs> which is which is mainly oriented towards answering the question about the enneagram mm -hmm. and it's in our we have addressed that in our book too um and so you know, here's what I like to point out with that. God does redeem, but he redeems his creation. He redeems people. He doesn't redeem tools mm -hmm. that are from the occult. He doesn't redeem. He, God is not going to redeem the Ouija board or tarot cards or astrology. He's not going to redeem those things. So there's, you know, to say that we can use it in a Christian way is like saying we can use tarot cards, you know, to discover God's will for us or something, you know, or let's do a tarot reading and I'll tell you about, you know, who you are and what your purpose is. You know, that's to, to try to make it into a Christian thing is probably the most deceptive thing that's going on with it. And when you have pastors who are teaching it and promoting it, then people assume these pastors have vetted it and they know what they're doing, um, but they're deceived. They're yeah. deceived too. And this thing has gotten so big in the church. It's taken over so much ground that it's just really, uh, it's really a huge thing. And I'm so glad that now we're having people like you, you know, speaking out and showing us what it really is and how it affected your life. That's, that's just very powerful. Well, and the main point is like, I've, I've told my friends who still very much love it. Um, I say, you know, the, the real, like, let's take a step back from the Enneagram. The real problem here is we are not respecting God. <laughs> We're not taking him seriously. It's like, we don't know who Yahweh really is because I, goodness, I went to Deuteronomy and I'm sure you guys are totally familiar with the passage where he's talking about um, pagan things. And he says that even if your wife who you love, your closest friend, your family entices you to worship other gods, they're to be put to death. And you're not to, you know, wait your hand. You need to strike. This is God. He takes these things very seriously. And if, if we're just like brushing it off our shoulders, like we can do whatever we want, there is a problem here. There's a bigger problem than the Enneagram. It's, it's yeah. you know, in God. Yeah, it's also saying the Bible is not sufficient. It's saying we need more than the Bible. And 
One of the things I noticed as I learned from Marsha about the Enneagram and became aware is, is the pridefulness that I heard people bragging about their Enneagram number. Did you find that pridefulness, Jillian, in, in your Enneagram community? Yes, absolutely. I loved being the four. <laughs> I especially, because, well, because every type has like this special thing about it. And a four is like rare and creative and we're, we're different than everyone else. And my husband was an eight and he's the champion. He's going to be the first one to charge. And my best friend is like the life of the party. And yes, there is so, and it's used as an excuse well, I'm not doing this because I'm a four and I don't have to. And you should understand that because, or you need to go read more about my type. You know, I pulled that card so many times in my marriage. It's so, it's so sad, but I, I did. It became quote unquote gospel in our house, even with my children. I mean, oh, it sounds like it, it took over as your, your self-perceived yeah. identity rather than being a child of God. Absolutely. And, but believing deceptively that it was kind of a part of that you know like this is how I'm a child of God he made me a four you know like wow. and I'm so proud of it and yes the pride and also kind of the arrogance and looking down at other numbers like oh you're a two so you're you know you're a doormat you just you just keep <laughs> it. you know or you're a one you're stingy you're a perfectionist like it becomes a language and I mean, it, in our little circle, and I was a pastor's wife, in our church, it was language. Like, oh, she's being a two. Oh, stop being a four. You know, like, this is what we were talking about. And it was in the church. And yeah, I'm, so, yeah. I'm so grateful for God's grace. Well, know? it's it's interesting that you said you got into it through Myers-Briggs. And I just want to just kind of circle back to that, because um, some people know I'm a former psychotherapist. I have a BA and MA in psychology from Chapman University. And we studied personality tests a lot. And Myers-Briggs is based on Carl Jung's work. And he's not much better than Claudia Naranjo and the rest of the Enneagram group. Uh, Carl Jung was basically an occultist. So I, I'm not a fan of personality types. Um, I've given them, I've taken them. Uh, I think there's some that, uh, like the Stanford Bernay, which is not a personality test. It's actually a mental health test. But, it, you know, I found that in the Myers-Briggs community too. I don't know if you did, Marcia, that, oh, we were an EMFT or, you know, we were all about being an extrovert, introvert, a, this yeah. and that. And, and it's, again, like you've been saying, Jillian and Marcia, it's that pointing away from the gospel and pointing to self. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know what it reminds me of, because I was a professional astrologer for many years. It is an exact parallel to astrology, where once you know, some people just know their zodiac signs. So they know I was born such and such a date. So I'm an Aries. Oh, that means that's why I'm like this. And that's why I get mad so easily, et cetera, et cetera. If they know more, if you get your chart done um, or able to figure out your planets at birth, then you get even more complicated, you know, oh, so I'm an Aries, but my moon is in Pisces. Oh, that's why I struggle with this. And then my, you know, my, um, my Saturn is in Capricorn. So I really have to deal with this and it's in the, uh, third house, and so I, I, I don't talk to people when I'm mad or whatever. You, you begin to get into these layers of yourself and your behavior, and you start, you filter everything that happens to you, you start filtering it. So something happens to you or someone says something to you and you have a reaction and you think, okay, yep, that was definitely my moon in Gemini. That's why I reacted that way. And because you, you start to filter it through, those uh, zodiac signs and planets, you, it seems more real. It becomes even more real to you. So if you're filtering things through your type and your wing or whatever, it's more real. It's like, oh yeah, see, I know that's like just like a four. That's that's so that's so true of me. <laughs> and you begin to exclude anything that might uh, show that that there's something not true about it. Or you exclude other things about you that are not for. And uh, because that, that's the way this stuff works. And I, I think Doreen probably understands this even better with her psychology degrees. We like to look for patterns and we like to identify with something. Because it makes us feel special or it makes us feel secure maybe. 
And so we identify with these patterns and we tend to exclude the things that we don't like or we don't think fit us. And you, uh, you end up basically, you're not getting a true picture of, of who you are anyway with these, with these things. I think all personality tests are somewhat artificial and I don't think anything can really capture the complexity of a person because of how God made us. We are all unique and we are all complex people with all kinds of little uh, facets <laughs> to, our, to who we are. And no test can capture that. But I think what's particularly dangerous about the Enneagram is that it's become a spiritual tool where pastors are using it to, um, for their team. You know, all the pastors in the church do it and then to help understand how to work together or they use it for discipleship. Um, and I mean, that's, I mean, what's supposed to be used for discipleship? God's word, you know, not, not, not this tool. So it has, it has started being a substitute. And it's a big business too, isn't it, Marsha? Yeah, it's, it's, yes, it is. Because now um, there are 27, Don told me this the other day, Don Vino, who, who uh, with his wife, Joy, co-authored uh, Richard Warren, the Enneagram, um, with me, uh, he said he's counted 27 Enneagram titles from what are viewed as evangelical publishers. And this is, the first one was only in 2016, and the second one was 2017, and maybe the third one, because I know St Suzanne Stabile came out with a book shortly after, but we've gone from that in just less than four years to 27 mm. titles. Yeah, the, the deception is just, it just is a progressive disease. Yeah. And these publishers who are just focused on money, they see the money that can come in and from people who are wanting to answer the question, who am I? And that question can only be answered in the Bible. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Who think... are you and who are you becoming? As a believer, you're being conformed to the image of Christ. That's you're being right. pruned, you know, you're being, if needed, and uh, we all need it, you know, disciplined. <laughs> and, you know, you're being shaped and, and guided and led by the spirit and, and shaped by God's word. And I mean, there's nothing better than that. That is such a gift, you know, from the Lord. And it kind of, that kind of gets all ignored or kind of just, you know, scratched over with this Enneagram, because anytime you have something that focuses on the self, people just, you know, go for it. It's, it's just, it's kind of, a, it's a natural tendency of our fallen nature. And that's one reason it's so popular, I think, is because of that self uh, orientation. And, and like Jilly, you had mentioned earlier, there's something even bigger than that. And that is, I think this, this tendency towards self orientation had already begun in the church that had already started before the Enneagram came along. And so the Enneagram, it kind of, all that other stuff paved the way. And then the Enneagram kind of just fell right in there because it was, the time was right. The self-orientation stuff had, had softened to the church, I think. And, and it fit right in for that. The Enneagram also gives you almost permission to sin. And I want to kind of explain that a little bit. Um, me as a four, or was a four, you know, not a four, but you know, um, <laughs> they talk about how we romanticize a lot of things. And so just being completely transparent, vulnerable with you guys, um, if I felt inclined, like, oh, a man might be flirting with me, if my flesh was like, oh, I should flirt back, that Enneagram thing would go in my head like, this is just a natural part of who you are, Jill. You are a romanticizer. You, you know, this is who you are and it's not bad. Don't act on it, but it's okay to fantasize. You're, you know, that's mm -hmm. who you are. Or I used, my favorite band used to be a goth band. And so there was like this fascination with death I had and being a four, you're very melancholy. And so it gave me almost permission to want to go back to being fascinated with death. And it, it got very fuzzy on what is actually, you know, this is Bible. This is this God wants this for you. This is who you are. And like, well, that doesn't really fit with the Bible, but I guess it does because you're telling me that God made me this way and this is okay. And somehow it goes back to him. So just, it's so deceptive because I wouldn't have thought that I would be so easily deceived, but oh my. 
yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about deception. It's subtle and it's appealing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it doesn't usually look horrible or it doesn't repulse us. So that's what draws us in. And once you get kind of drawn in, then you, if you want to believe it, then you believe it. You know, if it's something that gives you some kind of satisfaction or gratification, then you're, you're like, oh, okay, yeah. And then if it can be justified as biblical, like, oh, but this is how God made me. So it's okay for me to, you know, act this way and to try to understand myself as a four. Then you feel, okay, yeah, it's all right. You've rationalized it. That's, you know, and, and we're very good as human beings at rationalizing things. We are, we are great at it. We're, we're experts. <laughs> so, I mean, that's why the Bible warns believers over and over again about false teachings, because God knows we're susceptible. And we're to have no confidence in the flesh. I was just reading that verse. Yeah. And this is, that is exactly what it is. And the thing about the church you were saying that self self has just this love for self has just infiltrated especially in the last so many years it just seems like it is such a me-centered gospel and i'm so grateful that i've really been you know uh, my eyes have been open to a lot of that stuff i was telling doreen i used to be a body positive influencer and i was always telling girls under the umbrella of biblical truth mm -hmm. that God wants you to, you know, you need to love yourself so you can love others. You need to love yourself so you can love God. And that is completely unbiblical. And so now my whole mission and my whole, my, I mean, what really makes my heart beat is to talk about dying to self, which is painful. It's not fun <laughs> to carry your cross. It can be very painful, but oh my, you ladies know, like the, the treasure of Jesus is worth everything. Uh -huh. And so that's really a, Another reason I've been the Enneagram thing came up is because I'm like, guys, do you see this? It is all about self. Yeah, you cannot get out of that. Let's just unpack because we're going to get letters otherwise. People saying, but Jesus said that it's important to love your neighbor as yourself, and that is twisting scripture if you think that's about self love. The only place I can find, and Marcia, back me up on this uh, if you know anything else, is Ephesians 5, where it's a directive command to husbands to love their wives because and it says that's the closest thing to loving yourself is if you could love your wife i can't find anything else in the bible about self-love can you, you no of you? There, yeah. there isn't anything and that no. verse that um julie quoted you know that's really saying you know love your neighbor as yourself it's a, it, because it's based on the idea that we already do love ourselves <laughs> You know, so as much as you care for yourself and care about yourself, then you have that same care and love for your neighbor. So yeah. it's not saying you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. No, not at all. And and they're not defining self-love like it's defined in modern terms, like going to the spa. It doesn't say that. You know, yeah. <laughs> the apostles were not at the spa. No. <laughs> exactly. I know this whole self-love thing is is very very much of a trap and um, the other thing is when you were talking about uh, what you, what they what you learned about the Enneagram you had this unique gift and then you had this uh, sin pattern or a sin that came with it and you were supposed to work you're supposed to deal with that right work through that and see all of that goes back to the um, Enneagram as taught by um, Ichazo and Naranjo which was the idea that we have a pure essence or pure self and it's been covered up by conditioning. Of course, they didn't talk about sin. It's been covered up by um, this conditioning we have from the culture and from our families and from growing up and from experiences and all of that is this layer and you have to get to the true self. And this is, Roar has a um, teaching on that about the true self and that's really what the Enneagram is about. It's to find the uh, true self, and Rohr teaches it, Richard Rohr teaches it as a self that was never separated from God, and, you know, because that's part of his belief system, and it's his book on the Enneagram that got the Enneagram into the church. That's how it got into the church. It was because he was, um, and still is, popular with the progressives. They started doing the Enneagram because of him and his book. And then it gradually seeped into uh, the more conservative evangelical church. And I've heard many pastors even recommend Richard War's book. Mm -hmm. 
So it's brought him, it's given him, you know, a, a crack in the door there, the door cracked open for him through the Enneagram. And Richard Rohr is heretical. I just, without going into long song and dance on him, <laughs> which I could easily do. No, um, we'll, we'll put a clip of his heresy right here okay. so people can see. I was the last generation of priests that had to learn Latin. And you probably know the, la the Latin word for God is Deus, D-E-U-S. Does that sound anything like Z-E-U-S? <laughs> of course it does. It's the same concept. It's the same word. We basically, again, along with uh, the whole Greco-Roman Empire, and it gave us many wonderful things, but our concept of God never moved much beyond Zeus. <laughs> uh, and, and Zeus was uh, throwing down thunderbolts at people he didn't like. You know, we just ch ch differentiated who the ones were we didn't like. Pagans and witches and women and heretics and sinners and every culture and every century decided on a different sinner. You know, if you look at all, always who were the sinners was different. But we had to scapegoat somebody because that keeps a group together. And when you're at the tribal level, that's what you want to do. You want to know you're right. You want to hold your knowing in a safe enclave so you don't expose it to any non-knowing, <laughs> whereas uh, uh, the majority of the mystery of the Trinity is unknowable. Hmm? But we thought we knew God, so we sort of pushed Jesus into the place of the Trinity. You know, I'm not a heretic in saying this, although to some of you it'll sound like it. To, as Christians day, do, to formally say Jesus is God is bad theology, is incorrect. The Trinity in Christian theology is God, all right? And when you pull Jesus out of this and put him up on a big throne that looks like Zeus, you no longer have a dynamic universe, really. That's a, you no longer have a God who is in the flow of everything, but a being instead of being itself. As you've taught many times, he's a universalist, a panentheist, and a... There's another word you use. He's a perennialist, Perennial. which is what I say instead of universalist, because they're a little... They, they essentially will end up the same way, but universalism is more about where you go after you die. Perennialism is a view of creation itself and God and that there's truth in all, but not, not there's truth in all religions. All religions share the same core truth. Mm -hmm. And so even though they're outwardly different, at their core, they're all the same. And what's at, what's at the core is, the, is divine reality which is often a term used for God. And the way that you get to this core, the way that you learn about this is that you have a realization of it through mysticism. So contemplative practices are pushed real heavily. And the Enneagram is attached to these ideas through Roar. And I'm finding more and more people who promote the Enneagram are heavily into the contemplative practices. Okay, the um, mysticism. Yeah, it's, I'm, I have been finding this for the past year, and I've been doing more and more posts on it. So I'm finding that, for example, the book from um, IVP, The Sacred Rhythm, Rhythms for the Enneagram, the four authors of that, three of them are spiritual directors, oh. which is a title from from contemplative. Um, yeah, I uh, went to two spiritual directors right after I was saved, and they told me I could still use cards and crystals and just awesome. incorporate Jesus into the new age, basically. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and so you've got this this contemplative spirituality, which is not Bible-based. And then you have a lot, I have found a lot of those people using perennial language. So now I'm thinking there is more of that perennial view in the church than I originally thought. Mm. And I found it big time with an author whose books are used on Christian campuses, David G. Benner. And he teaches, he's a master teacher at Richard Rohr's Center. And the first two books that came out, Road Back to You, Suzanne Stabile and Ian Cron. Suzanne Stabile was mentored by Richard Rohr. Ian Cron and Stabile both teach at his center. They both are, you know, associates, associates of his. And Chris Huritz, who wrote The Sacred Enneagram, which is the book that you had, Joey, he was mentored by Richard Rohr, and he learned the Enneagram from Richard Rohr and three New Agers, because he names them on the website on that, for that book. He names, I, I'm thanking my teachers, and then he names Richard Rohr and three New Agers. 
And Beth McCord, she and her husband supposedly teach the gospel-centered Enneagram. That's their thing. They say, oh, we don't teach this other, you know, New Age stuff. I don't know if they use the word ter term New Age, but they say, we don't teach this non-Christian stuff with it. She had six New Age teachers. So, you know, you start seeing all of this. It all, it's all kind of connected. We were um, in one of their marriage, they had like a marriage Enneagram thing. They're, yes, they do marriage seminars. Uh, yeah, they do seminars on how to use the Enneagram as a tool for your marriage. That's one of their, their big teachings. And well, that's, they, that's one of the reasons why people hang on to the Enneagram, isn't it? Because they focus on what they perceive are benefits. Yes. Like you were saying, Jilly, that it, it seemed like it was helping your marriage. When you look back, do you really think it was helping your marriage? No, I don't because... Honestly, even though I could probably say, I, oh, I would always say it gave us language that we didn't have before because, and let me give some insight to that. They, my husband was an eight and eights supposedly argue with everything. They are combative. And my husband is a little like that. So it was like, oh, see, you're just an eight. So we would use that language, but no, because it wasn't so it wasn't Bible. It wasn't relying on Jesus. It wasn't putting the Holy Spirit between each other. It was, it was not going to scripture. So I, even if I could say, eh, maybe, no, I'm going to say absolutely not. Yeah. Because it was not of God. And it, it was the illusion that it was helping your marriage. Oh, yeah. The illusion it, of benefits. Just like with you, Marsha, you've said many times when you were an astrologer, people would say, oh, this is helping me so much. Oh, my goodness. Yes, all of my clients including I did charts for a few people who were skeptical, who had been given the chart reading as a gift, you know, like for their birthday. And they're like, I remember one guy said to me, he was an atheist. He was married to a witch, but he was an atheist. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I think his wife gave it to him as a present. And he said, I want to tell you right up front that I don't really believe in astrology. And, um, but I'm willing to do this. And I said, okay. I said, that's fine. I'm just going to talk. And, you know, uh, we'll just see where it goes. Well, he was surprised. You know, he was like, wow, I can't believe that you, you said that. I can't believe that's true. And that happened with a couple of other people. So, um, what you know, this is where you start, you hear things that are true and you latch on to them. Yep. Um, it's because we're self-deceived ourselves. We don't really see ourselves as we really are. I think we tend to try to we always have a little slightly better picture of us or we really are. We got those nasty parts like, oh, no, I don't want, I'm not like <laughs> not that. Not me. That's <laughs> those people. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really like that. Other people are like that, but not me. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's very easy to kind of fall into this and believe it. And I had clients who said, oh, you're better than my therapist. You know, this really helps me. I did charts for, I did charts, relationship charts, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so people, husband and wives could understand each other, boyfriends, girlfriends, parents, children. And here's, here's a, here's a uh, passage of scripture that I like to think about or use when people bring this kind of thing up that it helped me or it was so true. In Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, it says, if a false prophet or dreamer of dreams comes and tells if those things come true, if their prophecies and dreams come true, but they lead you to other gods, have nothing to do with them, and do not listen to them. So even if somebody comes along with an Enneagram and says, this is you, this is you, this is your husband, you're like, wow, that really is. The Enneagram is not leading to Jesus. It is leading away from Jesus. So, and I think that's been pointed out many, many times in many ways on shows I've done and in our book and by other people. So that's a warning. God is actually telling us there that sometimes these people will say things that are true. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the marriage, you saying that it's, it's so, it's crazy. Cause I would have never thought I would have, if you said Jill astrology, I'd be like, Nope. Enneagram. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I totally, you know, but, um, I can think back to, to having these conversations with Jacob and my girlfriends about the Enneagram in our marriages. And it was, back to the pride thing, like it was so kind of contradictory to scripture because in scripture we're told to submit to our husbands, you know, we're told these things, but that is not what the Enneagram marriage stuff is. It's more like you need to understand me and you need to try to understand my type to better serve and communicate with me. And it is not this 
biblical understanding that God gave us of marriage of, yeah, husbands love your wives. Like Jesus, you know, love the church. Women submit to him. Like there, nope, that was not the, the feel of marriage in Enneagram. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's this, got a different spirituality to it. It does. And as a former independent, successful feminist, let me just say <laughs> it, it, it's just not of the road you want to take. It's feminism leads to destruction and pain and emptiness. I love that you said that. Mm. Yeah, I was a feminist too. I wasn't, that wasn't my main thing, but I definitely considered myself a feminist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was pro-choice and all the feminist agenda I was pretty much on board with. So, and I was surrounded by a lot of feminists in the new age. I mean, that's, that's pretty typical. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a very strong emphasis on the, on the female and power of the woman and all of that stuff and yeah it's very empty because all of this is from the flesh and like you said it sounds to me like the enneagram was actually um like fo making you focus on the flesh and having you un quote unquote understand each other according to the flesh well and, and you said like it, it's about like a truer self but they don't they word it more as um you need to be a, a healthy for or you're an unhealthy for so huh. like or you're in the middle so that's how they would gear you like determine yeah we need to work on you being a healthy type and so that's what you would kind of strive for basically oh deception deception the layers of deception and it's all the same yeah you know, your world was astrology marcia mine was the tarot cards and channeling and yours jillian was enneagram and it's the same author the devil and he's got the same signature on all his deception to lead people away from Jesus and the Bible. Yeah, and usually to self. Some it goes back to self. It really does. And that's that's what it's all about. And that is the that is the appeal of it. And that's the danger of it at the same time. Mm -hmm. It is. It makes yourself an idol. And we are commanded to not have any form of idolatry at all. Right. O only Jesus on the throne of our heart. That's right. Amen. <laughs> yeah. This is so interesting. So I, I just kind of want to ask you about introducing it to your church, Jillian. I mean, obviously, you've got a heart to help people. And was that really the motivation? And do you think that's why so many churches offer this? Or is there any financial reason that churches or is it seeker friendly to get uh, more congregants? Why are churches offering this? I'm not sure. Well, okay. So do you guys know about Sandals Church in California? Yeah. They, yeah. So that's where I learned a lot of like the biblical aspects to it. They do podcasts about- You mean, you mean unbiblical? Sorry. Yes. I'm, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the um, biblical aspects. Yes. The, yes. <laughs> the, the twisting, well, the twisted scripture <laughs> aspects. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm sure that they are profiting from, from this. Our little church in Missouri, it wasn't profit, but when you said seeker friendly, absolutely. I had more women show up to this Enneagram study we were doing than anything else that we ever did that was just Bible-based um, because we want to know about ourselves. We want to talk about ourselves. We love ourselves, you know? So, and truly, I mean, when I really think about it, yes, I really believed that this was so helpful and that we would learn how to even with the elders wives and me as the pastor's wife like let's learn how to communicate with each other better and you know because a lot of them are twos and that's the servant and i'm a four so i'm the i'm the more extroverted you know fairy type you know so i felt like it was my mission to try to get us to understand each other but that is not biblical <laughs> and, and, and some of those women that came to your groups were they perhaps unsaved people who didn't hear the gospel at that point. So there this were, could be a salvific issue. Yes. There were a couple of women there who were not, not saved. And I mean, I, this is why I made a public apology. Um, I felt very grieved to do so. Um, not only did I post it on my social media, but I did an entire podcast about it. And I, there are so many girlfriends of mine who like a couple of them are Enneagram coaches, like through the McCords, they have like a, you can become a Jesus Enneagram coach. Yeah. Wait, what? A Jesus Enneagram coach? Like a Christian, yeah, a Enneagram coach for Jesus, basically. Oh. Beth, McCord, Beth McCord started her own certification for the Enneagram and trains people. I forgot how many. She's got teams. Yeah, but to put the it. name of Jesus in that, that's, I, well, that they, hurts my heart. 
She says they do a gospel-centered Enneagram. Yes. And, uh, How my is that even possible? I, well, yeah, they're so deceived. And even when I came out with my podcast saying about the Enneagram and talking about it, even though I could say, doesn't, you don't, it's not bothersome to you on a very strong level that this came from automatic writing. No, because, because God can redeem it. And then they bring up that Paul verse about the bread, you know, being sacrificed to idols. Like, nope, it can totally be moved into something holy. Mm. And they are very adamant about that. Yeah. Were you, did you have any conviction, Jillian, when you were going through this? Did you or your husband, was there any conviction from the Holy Spirit at all as you look back? No, and I think that's because we were, you know, like you can harden your heart. I think we were both, um, I can say that we were neglecting um, scripture for these things that seemed biblical, but they weren't. And so not really. Honestly, no, until I started then praying more and being back in my Bible. And then all of a sudden it was like, I mean, it felt like I was wrecked. I mean, my, it was, it was, I just couldn't believe it. It was really one of those things like you were blind and now you see, like, I could not believe what I had done, what I had uh, shown to people, my children. I mean, my children would even say, I'm a four, you know, like my little one, like, and we had to go apologize to them and have a very you know, deep conversation about how mommy and daddy were very wrong. And this is what the Bible says. And this is what we're going to then move forward on in our family. Um, but no, I was, we were really deceived because it I seemed think, so biblical. I think people can make themselves insensitive to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so if they get into something that's really not from the Lord and they really get into it and they neglect Bible reading and Bible study or prayer you get you get insensitive so the holy spirit may be convicting but you're not receiving <laughs> you well, know now that you say that i'm thinking like um about four or five months ago when i really started on this getting out of the body positive self-love stuff and getting into like living holy you know kill self kind of stuff um i would have i had a couple women send me um these in, i think one of them was even your guys's video and said you need to watch this and i said i'm not ready because i think i knew I was not going to be happy with what was said and I wasn't ready to give it up. And then, but because I'm seeking, you know, I, I want to be a, a godly woman. I truly do. You know, I fail so much, but I truly have that desire. I finally listened and, and then, you know, got more into it, the research. And I was like, I need to repent and warn people. And it's hard because we're here at a new church. We just moved to Oklahoma and our new church there in the fall or in the spring, they have an Enneagram series coming up. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to be skipping out on that. Wow. Are you going to give yeah. us on any information? Absolutely. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Send them this video. Absolutely. I <laughs> get, I get so many messages almost every day um, about the Enneagram from people who are seeing it in their church. And either telling me about the uh, uh, attempt to talk to the leadership or, or a conversation they had or asking me how to talk to the leadership. So it's, it's an ongoing thing and it has, hasn't seemed to slow down to me. I mean, it's lately, it's, there's been a lot of it. And so I'm always getting messages from people about that. So I know it's out there because I, I otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be getting so many, so many messages on the Enneagram. Can I say something about the meat sacrifice to idols that Jilly mentioned? Because I, I've seen people bring that up um, and say, well, it's like the meat sacrifice to idols. Well, that's really about uh, an issue that had to do with conscience. And, the, and what God was saying is the meat, you can eat the meat if it doesn't bother your conscience. But when you think about it, meat is neutral. I mean, it's food. Okay, it comes from an animal that God made. I'm vegetarian. <laughs> but <laughs> it says, uh, very ironic for me to say this, but it comes from an animal that God made. And so it's neutral. It's not good or bad. Okay, he's not, God didn't say, oh, it's okay if you go sacrifice it to the idol. You know, that's all right if it doesn't bother your conscience. He just said, if you don't want to eat it, but if it doesn't bother your conscience, then you can eat it. If you're with other people, believers and it bothers their conscience then don't cause them to stumble so the issue there is about conscience and 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 
your relationship with other believers and who may be, you know, bothered by something that you're not bothered by. But the actual issue of what people are bothered by is neutral. The, the issue there was that it was being sacrificed to idols and uh, Gentiles who had become Christians and had been pagans and, you know, had done that. That was just too much, you know. If this was sacrifice to this idol, I used to do that. I don't want to have anything to do with that meat. So it bothered their conscience. So God said, don't do that to somebody. In the case of the Enneagram, the Enneagram is not neutral. It's not a neutral tool. I even did a post on it a while ago called, you know, the Enneagram is not spiritually neutral. And then I explained why it isn't. It has a spiritual dimension to it. It is not spiritually neutral, so it can't be compared to the meat sacrificed to idols. The analogy does not hold. It's amazing how many people use that verse. Um, I just recently did a Halloween podcast, too, about abstaining from Halloween. And that is the verse that I got thrown most, um, that it can be redeemed. And it's, I said the same thing. It's amoral. It's not, you know, like the food. That's what I was explaining. Like, it's not immoral or moral it's, it's not the same thing as what we're talking about when you're dealing with something that is demonic but when you don't want to change you man people will dig their feet in and they will find any excuse to yep. harden their hearts and not obey which is heartbreaking yeah yeah and so all we can do is pray for them and keep speaking the truth and sharing the gospel I've had so many people write to me lately who said, when you first converted, I was so mad at you and I would put you down. And then Jesus called me oh. and they write to me and they're apologizing for slandering me in the past and saying that they had um, Jesus do a supernatural work in their heart as well. And oh, that's now they're saved and they understand. So we just pray that God uses this video and all of your great work, Marcia, and your book um, for his glory and plant seeds thank you yes we're praying you know i think we're now that more people are speaking out and more people are saying i have had people say you know when i understood what it was you know and that it came from this automatic writing or i realized it had no validity i i didn't you know i decided i can't do this anymore and more people are coming out and saying that and the more people do that then other people feel more free you know, and a little, they feel a little more like they can speak out. Because I think yeah. a lot of people before, if you spoke out against it, man, people would just jump all over you. I know because I was constantly <laughs> jumped on by people, but I'm used to that in my ministry. So I'm, it's like something I deal with on a lot of issues. So I, I'm kind of used to it, but it is hard. I mean, even, even for me, even though I'm used to it, it's hard if people keep arguing with you or telling you you're wrong. Or, you know, what's the matter with you? It's just, you know, this tool to help you or it helped me and my husband. So why are you against it? Yeah, and they, you know, they call us you legalists. Like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Like they'll say, well, you're just being legalistic mm -hmm. or you're like a Pharisee or something. And they paint you as the bad guy. Right. And so it's hard to go against that. It, I understand it's hard to speak out. So I think the more people speak out and you're going to help a lot of people, Jilly, by coming forward like this and being so public about it. Um, as somebody who was really into it, who was a pastor's yeah. wife who was into it. I mean, you know, kudos to you because for speaking out because God's going to use that to open a lot of people's eyes and to help also people maybe who have doubts and have been wondering will now feel encouraged. Like, oh, wow, she did it. And she saw it was wrong, and I've been kind of having my doubts, but I'm afraid to speak out or ask questions, but now I know I can. So I really think that that's, you know, the Lord's going to use you. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I would like to speak about automatic writing, because I don't think I ever defined it when we've had the Claudia Naranjo of clip like we're having in this one so i used to do automatic writing as part of the channeling work that i did as a heretic in the new age and what the processes of automatic writing is emptying your mind which already is dangerous because that leaves room for demonic infiltration and you literally listen for a voice or a feeling or a thought or sometimes there's the sense real sense that someone takes over the pencil 
or the keyboard and writes through you. And you're usually not even aware of what's being written through you. And that's how Claudia Naranjo came up with these nine enneotypes. That is absolute occult. That's even darker than most of the new age that you see. And it means that the enneagram, the enneotypes, are doctrines of demons. And then people say, well, the Bible was automatic written. Oh, no, it wasn't. There's 66 books of the Bible written by 40 plus authors, human authors, and it has consistency from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. You can see that the voice of the Bible is, as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, it's God-breathed, entirely given by God through human authors who were obedient to him. Exactly. And somebody actually recently asked me, well, what's the difference I think it was in a, an interview. I can't remember if it was an interview or if, if I can't remember now, but I know someone asked me. <laughs> um, they said, well, what's the difference between automatic writing and the authors of, of scripture? Isn't it like the same thing? <clears throat> and I said, no, because an automatic writing, which I never did, I tried it and it didn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't get there. I just couldn't open myself up all the way for that influence, although I certainly had, I had spirit guides but I couldn't allow a loss of control or whatever I thought I had to lose. Anyway, I couldn't do it, but I knew what it was. Automatic writing is you're not really in charge. You're letting something else take charge. And like you said, often you didn't even know what you were, you were writing. Whereas in scripture, God, you, he, the Holy Spirit is writing and God's God breathed words but God still uses the personalities of those writers. He still, you know, you can tell the different styles and personalities in some of the, especially the New Testament writers. And um, so they aren't taken over, you know. It's not like they're a robot and something's like, you know, <laughs> coming through and they don't know what they're saying. They're conscious. They're conscious. And they know what they're writing. And God's using them that way, but he doesn't erase them. Automatic writing sort of erases the spirit, erases the person it's channeling through. And that's not true with, with scripture. So, you know, the, the, that's, there's a huge difference there. And then we also see that um, when they write, the words that are written are all consistent throughout the whole mm -hmm. Bible. There's a consistent message because behind it all is one author. But God still is able to use these individuals. And it's a process that we can't totally understand because it's just a mysterious process. How did God get those words through those people, but yet they retained their individuality? Mm -hmm. And they, you know, were still, Paul was still Paul and Peter was still Peter, <laughs> you know? And they didn't like, they didn't all become like some kind of robot. Exactly. So it's just the way God, it's the way God did it. It's something mm -hmm. with, kind of mysterious because God does it and we can't understand it because you know we, we're, we can't do something like that so I don't know so to me that's that's how I, I explained it more or less mm -hmm. yeah when you would do that was it your handwriting or was it a different handwriting when I would do automatic writing with a pen or a pencil it would often change my handwriting my grammar my spelling and there'd be doodles I mean, there was clearly a being taking over the instrument I was writing with, and, and that would be the same with the keyboard. Uh, the, I did a whole book on this called uh, Angel Therapy. Don't buy the book. Burn it. It's horrible. Um, but it reminds me of what Sarah Young says she's doing with so-called oh. Jesus, with Jesus Calling. And, and it's just, it's not Jesus. Those weren't angels of God. Those are demons who, as 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, masquerade as an angel of light. And we have to be so discerning. Uh, you mentioned Deuteronomy 13's perfect proof text there, Marcia. I also go to 1 John 4 to test the spirits mm -hmm. and see if they're pointing you to Jesus or not. And I mean, you, once you, if you're really honest with yourself and the Holy Spirit and you compare to Scripture, you can see a counterfeit. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's it, it. Yeah, you can. You have to really be in the Word and study God's Word, and you have to be willing to see it. Because if the deception appeals to you enough that you don't want to see it, mm -hmm. you can override that. You know. Um, so that's part. That's the that's the danger. But then that's why we have. That's why we're warning about it. You know. That's why you're doing this video during. You know to 
to let people know the truth about this because all of those Enneagram books, those 27 titles, repeat the same falsehoods that it, that they either say, well, we're not sure where it's from, but it's probably ancient, or maybe it came from this fourth century monk. Um, and they all repeat these falsehoods and they all act like, like, well, we don't really know for sure, but it, we think it came this, from here. And none of that is true. Now, none it, of them tell the truth of what, of what it is. And, and would it even matter if it's from a, a monk? Or if yeah, it's yeah, if right. It's, well, yeah, it, it wouldn't. I mean, even if it was from a fourth century It's, it's monk, heresy. It would, that doesn't mean that it's, it's from God. So even if it was, that doesn't count. But I think what really bothers me is that these books are actually repeating lies. They're actually repeating. I just heard, I just heard, um, I've been working most of yesterday and today on my next post. And it's on a pastor who, um, at first I didn't realize this. I was looking into him because of a quote. Someone gave me a quote from him that was very strange. Okay, the beginning of the quote is, um, spiritual masters, or this is part of the beginning, spiritual masters, both inside and outside the Jesus tradition. What? Okay, that, yeah, that all kinds of red flags went up for me because for one thing, tr Jesus tradition or Christian tradition is often used by perennialists. Yeah, and the Roman Catholic Church is all about tradition. Yeah, but, the, but the, the, in this case, it's not tradition of a church. It's, the, it's a word that perennialists use because they aren't really aligned completely with a particular religion. They, they call themselves that. I'm not saying he's a perennialist, but that, that's the language. They call themselves that, but they really believe everything is this core divine reality. That's what the real truth is underneath all of the, you know, Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, you know, those are all the outward things. And then underneath it's this one root they all come from. Hmm. So that's what it made me think of. And I thought, what? That's a strange thing for a pastor to say. So I decided I needed to look into him. And man, all you know what I did? I said, let me see what happens. I put his name followed by Richard Rohr in Google. And something came up. Yeah. And man, that was it. I spent <laughs> hours, hours. Um, he, he does, a, there's a message he gives. And there's also a page beneath it with things from him that he's talking about, he's talking about the Enneagram. And he quotes Richard Rohr. That's why that search yielded that result. And what I found there was just, I just kept saying to myself, oh, wow, I can't believe it. And I would read a little further and like, oh, wow, I can't. Then I'd listen to him as well. And um, that ended up being a lot of material for me to try to organize and write. So that post is going to be hopefully out tomorrow. And um, I, I'll try to send, send the link to you guys. Yeah, we'll put the link it. in the video here, okay. as well as the link to Marsha's uh, website and her Facebook group, and also to her book, it's, which has got all this research in it. And it's a good book to give to your pastor, by the way, if there is an egram in your church. And a lot of people have told me they've gotten the books for their pastors. The, the yes. The book on Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret, they have, they have gotten it for them. And could, one guy said he met with a pastor who listened to him, and the pastor said after the meeting, I really need more information. And so this, this young man said, well, I don't know if he's a young man, but this guy said, <laughs> he said, well, actually, I have a book for you. <laughs> and he told me he had, bought, he had bought a book for the pastor. So, you know, he said, I'm going to give you a book. So that was great, you know. Wow. Perfect. Thank you for all these tools and all the research that you've done and are doing, Marsha. I mean, like I told you, the first time I met you and you were talking about Enneagram, I said, what is this? I don't even see how this is relevant. <laughs> and then after that is when I went to a Christian conference and everyone was bragging about their Enneagram numbers. I was like, that's why it's relevant. This is deception and pridefulness. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's, it was good timing that you, I'm sorry that you heard that at the conference, but it was good timing. Yeah. It's kind of like, you were wondering, and then God said, okay, here, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I was like, Marcia, come back on the show, please. We need to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. And so I came back, and boy, did we talk about it. A lot of mm. people have referenced that episode, Doreen, and said, I'm so glad I saw, 
I saw that episode with you and Doreen doing the talk about the Enneagram. It really helped me understand. So, yes. yeah, it was good. It was good you did that. Uh, I'll put that episode too um, okay. because it's got the full history and and the picture. Everyone associated with the Enneagram is so creepy looking. They look like they're from the Adams family. You know, <laughs> it's like I mean, if nothing else, it'll scare you to see the originators of. Yeah, George Gurdjieff is the. Uh... Yeah, he's quite striking looking, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, yeah, the people, I mean, you look at the people, George Gurdjieff and Oscar Chazo and Claudio Naranjo, I mean, a Gnostic spiritual teacher, an occultist, and a New Age spiritual seeker into the occult. I mean, these are, these are where it comes from. All, and all in the 20th century, not ancient. <laughs> Yeah, not ancient. Not, not that that would matter. You know, yeah, <laughs> there's ancient Hinduism's ancient, and it's yeah, heretical exactly. too. So exactly. Yeah. Well, Jillian, is there anything else that you'd like to warn people about who are still hanging onto the enneagram and saying, "But, but, but"? I think that it's it's really important as a if you're a Christian and you are being told that it's it's satanic, you should get away from it, and you're putting your foot down. I mean, there's a danger in not listening to God and knowing what you're supposed to be doing and not doing it. And so I would just, I would just say, let go of your pride and submit to the word of God, please. And I even said this in my podcast, like, I understand if you have like your whole ministry or your whole brand is, or you're an Enneagram coach is all wrapped up in this. And you're like, this is going to take away my money. This is going to take away uh, popularity. I'm going to lose all my social media followers. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Honestly, like, let it go. And Doreen, and both of you, you guys have walked that, where you've had to let go of things that are not of God, and it costs you greatly. But being a Christian is co costs us. We need to count the cost. And so I guess I would just say in love, there, there are people who will support you through giving it up. Uh, but trust God. He is sovereign, and he will, he will honor that. That is... He will, he will bless you, just not in a word of faith kind of way, but <laughs> he, will, he will wrap his arms around you, and uh, there's a lot of support for people who are getting out of this stuff. So just be brave and, and let it go. Well, we sure appreciate your boldness. If you're hanging on to it and you, you still want to do the Enneagram or you think there's some way to justify it, you know, please... Ask the Lord to help you accept the truth. Tell the Lord that you want the truth. Because as Christians, you know, we're saved by a Savior who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so, therefore, if he is the truth, which he is, we should want truth in every area of our life. And actually, if you get rid of something like that, I bet Jilly felt unburdened. It was like throwing away a burden. Yeah. So you think that you like it and it's wonderful, but you're going to feel better when you when you depart from it. <laughs> There's nothing better than Jesus.